This is number eight in a series of 80 Old Testament lectures. We're discussing some considerations about the, the ark and about the universal one-year-long flood. I'd like to bring up something now that uh, I suppose no other single question concerning the flood will more quickly bring out the agnostic sneers and the believer's fears than this one. And here's the question. Were there dinosaurs on board the ark? Well, you know, I suppose we could also say, did men and dinosaurs live at the same time? And uh, even before I went to Bible school, I had the idea that it was because uh, as a boy, I used to remember reading Alley Oop, and uh, the cartoon uh, people told me that there was dinosaurs, and then I remember uh, watching Fred Flintstone on television, and so I was pretty well persuaded, I suppose, a prejudice toward the opinion that there were dinosaurs, but even before I made a study from the Word of God. But uh, seriously, there is now definite mounting evidence that man and dinosaurs did indeed live at the same time. Uh, for example, uh, there's evidence of these large reptiles that have been found since the flood. Dinosaur footprints have been located in the same rock strata with human prints, footprints in Glen Rose, Texas, and elsewhere in the United States. And then uh, we're told that dinosaur eggs were found off the coast of Madagascar up to a thousand years ago. So, uh, the, uh, the evolutionist, of course, would not claim this at all. He would not agree with it because uh, evolution says that the dinosaurs died out during the Jurassic period uh, over 200 million years ago. And therefore, any indication like in Glen Rose, Texas, in this uh, same rock strata, would be, uh, have to be reinterpreted. For example, uh, down there when this was found, uh, some scientists went down there and they said, all right, the footprints belonging to the, that look like dinosaur footprints, these are real, these are genuine, but the other kind, the human footprints, and by the way, these human footprints were very large, some 18 inches, and of course, uh, this might tie into the giant word there in Genesis chapter 6, we don't know, but before the flood, but that uh, they said, no, these are imitation footprints, uh, some person got their uh, fun, uh, so to speak, and going out there and digging into the rock bed itself because dinosaurs and human beings cannot exist at the same time regardless of what the evidence might say because uh, our theory says they could not have existed and uh, the evidence notwithstanding. Uh, well, some of the citizens there in uh, Glen Rose, Texas got a bulldozer and they dug back into the wall, or that is to say dug back into the uh, bank of the river bed there and they found that the tracks continued on back after they dug the material out. And so whoever uh, dug those in the first place in the rock uh, was apparently uh, a superman because he was able to get behind all that dirt and continue the trail. No, I think the simple, honest evidence would certainly indicate, if not prove, that dinosaurs and men did indeed exist at the same time. Not only that, but in Rhodesia, in certain caves, and in the West, in America here, in certain Western states, uh, we found pictures of the scientists, the anthropologists have found pictures, carvings on the ca in the walls, the caves of dinosaurs, as well as other animals that lived in uh, America even a few thousand years ago. And uh, I think it's it's rather unusual that here you would have uh, these early artists drawing creatures that they never saw, if indeed they never saw them. I think, again, the logical, reasonable conclusion is that they drew those animals that they saw. Now, uh, does the Bible have anything to say about dinosaurs and uh, about uh, some of these uh, prehistoric creatures? Yes, I think it does. In the book of Job, we read in Job 40 and 41 uh, the mention of two unknown animals. One is the Leviathan, and the other is the Behemoth. And uh, God is talking to Job, and Job is sort of bad-mouthing God, and he's saying, Lord, you're, 
You're letting things get away from you. The devil is really persecuting me. Of course, he didn't know why he was being persecuted, but Job knew he was suffering for something. And he said, Lord, uh, are you sort of losing control of the universe? And God reassures Job that he is still as strong as he ever was. And God says, Job, I want you to consider what I can do. My strength, I can control the mighty behemoth and the mighty leviathan. Now, what kind of animals was he talking about? What kind of creatures is he describing here in Job 40 and 41? Well, some reference Bible, Bibles indicate that, uh, or they suggest rather, that the Leviathan was probably a crocodile or an alligator, and the, uh, the behemoth was perhaps an elephant. Well, you know, when I r used to read this and, uh, and study it, that bothered me somewhat because God here takes an entire chapter or two entire chapters and really he sort of brags about how he can control these mighty creatures. And I thought, well, now, that's not that great an accomplishment if uh, Behemoth, for example, Behemoth simply speaks of, a, of an elephant because I remember as a boy going to uh, Forest Park in St. Louis, Missouri and to the uh, circus there and I would... Uh, like to sit in the front row and I'd see these uh, pretty little girls come out wearing 80, 90, maybe 100 pounds and uh, they would take these great big massive elephants and they'd march them around the ring and all oh, they had them trained and they could make them stand on two uh, back legs and uh, they would throw a ball and the elephants would catch it and uh, they would ride these elephants and the elephants would pick them up and put them down whenever they told them to and they had this great big uh, gigantic loop and uh, they would uh, set the loop on fire, this big ring, and at the command, these little girls, uh, actually, uh, as far as size is concerned, I mean, uh, could actually cause these mammoth beasts to jump through that burning ring. And uh, I thought, well, now, you know, they can do that. And uh, God, uh, are you just maybe perhaps doing a little bragging here about how you can control the mighty elephant? And then the, uh, the Leviathan, does that really speak of a crocodile or an alligator? Well, I remember some time ago in Florida at one of the uh, shows down there, and I, re I remember watching a man uh, wrestle with an alligator, and he lived to brag about it. Now, had he not, had he lost the battle, he wouldn't have lived to do anything. But here a man, a sinful human being for $100 a show, could do something like that. No, I don't think that God is talking about the alligator or crocodile or the uh, hippopotamus here or the rhinoceros or the elephant. Notice the description here in Job chapter 41 concerning Behemoth. God says, Behold now, Behemoth, he eateth grass as an ox, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He goes on to say, he moveth his tail like a cedar, or like a cedar tree. Did you ever see an elephant move his tail? Now what I'm saying here is if you substitute the word behemoth for brontosaurus, I think that you have a perfect description here of a dinosaur or a brontosaurus. In other words, I'm thinking that God here is describing a dinosaur. And uh, he would not have described something that Job himself perhaps did not know about. Now, we don't know when the book of Job was written. Some believe that Job lived even before or perhaps during the time of Abraham. Now, Abraham lived around 2000, 2200, somewhere along in there, B.C. Job might have lived a few centuries before that. So let's say 2500 B.C. to 2000 B.C., and uh, if that be the case, then I'm suggesting to you there is some evidence in the Bible that Job himself lived during the dinosaur age, the dinosaurs that escaped the flood. Well, now, what about the dinosaurs on board the ark? And I think it's very logical to assume that if God made the dinosaurs on the sixth day, as the Bible says he made all creatures by the end of the sixth day, and God told Noah to take uh, male and female of all these animals. Then he took a male and female dinosaur on board the ark. Obviously, he would not have probably taken a full-grown 60-ton brontosaurus. He probably did take a baby male dinosaur and a baby 
female dinosaur, perhaps weighing, weighing maybe several hundred pounds. Well, what happened to the dinosaurs after the flood? Well, scientists estimate that a healthy 60-ton brontosaurus would have eaten as much as two to three tons of grass and vegetation each day. And of course, the flood wiped out most of the vegetation, and so I think it's only logical to conclude that maybe a thousand years later, or even less, perhaps shortly after the time of Job, that the dinosaurs died out simply because of the lack of enough food to keep them alive. But at any rate, I believe the Bible definitely teaches that Job saw dinosaurs, or at least he was familiar with them, which would then prove that Noah did indeed take a male and female dinosaur on board the ark. Now another question, learning the ark itself and the flood, how did the animals get from Asia Minor, or from Turkey, Mount Eret, where the ark landed, to their present location? For example, we find kangaroos in only one nation or one continent in the world, unless uh, they're brought uh, and put in zoos. And they're only, the only natural habitat of kangaroos, of course, is in Australia. And the giant panda bear that uh, becomes so famous, especially since Mr. Nixon was given one in his first visit to China, is found in China. You don't find them anywhere else. And other animals are found in other uh, remote areas of the world. Now, how did they get from, from Asia Minor or from Mount Ararat to their present location? Uh, God could have sort of flipped them across the sea, I guess, but I think it's far more logical uh, to consider a uh, possibility here as offered by uh, Professor Paul A. Moody of the University of Vermont. Now, he's not attempting to explain how animals got from from uh, the ark landing to where they are now, but he's attempting to explain how do we how do we uh, explain how animals got anywhere from what, how did they cross the sea? You know, they didn't build boats. And so he says this, In times of flood, large masses of earth and entwining vegetation, including trees, may be torn loose from banks of rivers and swept out to sea. Sometimes such masses are encountered floating in the ocean out of sight of land still lush and green, with palms 20 to 30 feet tall. It is entirely probable that land animals, now listen to this, may be transported long distances in this manner. In this manner. In fact, again, Dr. Ernest Mayer of Harvard University records that many tropical ocean currents have a speed of at least two knots an hour. This would amount to 50 miles a day and as much as 500 to 1,000 miles in three weeks. And then uh, another quotation from Dr. Alfred S. Rohner of Harvard University, and he says this, It seems certain that land animals do at times cross considerable bodies of water where land connections are utterly lacking. Floating masses of vegetation such as are sometimes found off the mouth of the Amazon may be one means of affecting this type of migration. And so this would, I believe, uh, give some indication perhaps or suggestion as to how maybe by means of natural land and sea movement uh, God transported these animals from uh, the Mount of Eret to their present location. Now, another question, was there an ice age? The evolutionist says there were indeed a number of ice ages, and the last one uh, stopped uh, growing, began to recede from 40 to, to uh, perhaps 10,000 years ago. Well, the Bible does not give that time, allow for that time duration, but uh, it does, many believe, allow for one ice age. And this ice age followed would be the logical result of a universal flood. I want to quote here now from Dr. Reginald Daly, uh, the University of Missouri, who says this, who is a believer. The ice age automatically followed the universal flood. There could not have been a universal flood without a glacial age following. The deserts were sopping wet for centuries following the flood. There were lakes everywhere. 
and evaporation kept humidity at 100%. There was rain every day in the tropics and snow every day in the north country. Winds carried moisture-laden clouds supersaturated to northern Canada, Scotland, Norway, and Sweden, where snow poured down every day and every hour from November until April, probably 500 or 1,000 feet thick the first winter. Multiply 500 feet of snow by 100 years of wet weather. This makes 50,000 feet of snow, which would settle down into approximately 5,000 feet of ice, the glacial age. The tops of these mountains a mile high would be so cold that snow would continue to pile up all spring and early fall as well as all winter, leaving such a brief, chilly July-August summer that only a small amount of snow would melt. And uh, so he uh, get, goes on to say that uh, this could well be the ice age that some evolutionists have claimed to found. Now, this does not mean, of course, that the Bible teaches there was a universal ice age. Uh, even the evolutionist do, does not believe this, that it covered all land continents, but uh, perhaps in North America, for example, maybe 30 to 40 percent of uh, the area was covered by an ice age. And this seems to fit in here with the Bible scheme of things. Okay, now, another question. Where did all the flood waters go? All this water that God poured down upon the earth. And uh, Hebrew scholar John Whitcomb says, even as the beginning of the flood year was characterized by supernatural intervention, so also the end of the flood was brought about by a stupendous miracle of God. Apart from this, the waters would have covered the earth forever, and all terrestrial life would soon have come to an end. Two passages in widely separated Old Testament books deal with this particular activity of God. The first in Genesis 8 verses 2 to 3 tell us that the fountains of the deep were stopped and the waters returned from off the earth continually. End of quote. And then he goes on to say, since the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep involved the uplift of ocean floors, the stopping of these fountains must refer to a reversal of this action whereby new and much deeper ocean basins were formed to serve as vast reservoirs for the two oceans which were separated from each other by the atmospheric expanse before the flood. Now, these two oceans separated, of course, was the waters above the firmament from the waters below the firmament. A natural result of this subsistence was that the waters returned from off the earth continually permitting continents to emerge from the oceans again as they had done on the third day of creation. So one passage that indicates this, the stopping of the fountains of the deep in Genesis chapter 8, and then the second passage that sheds light on this, the termination of the flood, is Psalm 104, verses 6 and 9. And uh, he goes on to say, though it contains several figures of speech, the passage is clearly historical in its reference to the flood. Then he says, note, for example, the statement of verse 6, the water stood above the mountains. And then that of verse 9, thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they may not turn again to cover the earth. End of quotes. And uh, Whitcomb says, the latter is obviously a reference to the rainbow covenant of Genesis 9, in which God assured mankind that there would never be a universal flood. And one final statement from Dr. Whitcomb. By the way, I'm taking this in his from his book, The World That Perished, which is an excellent book, and I would recommend uh, if you want uh, an additional study of this subject, you purchase that book. Now he says the key statement in this passage, in Psalm 104, verse 8, for our purposes is in the beginning of verse 8, quote, the mountains rose and the valleys sank. He says, we have already seen in Genesis 8, verse 2, that the ocean basins were lowered at the termination of the flood. And with this concept, the phrase, the valleys sank down, is in agreement. 
In other words, Whitcomb concludes, God supernaturally depressed various parts of the earth's crust and into these places which God founded for them the waters fled and hasted away there to abide while this earth exists never again to cover the continents end of quotes from dr whitcomb all right now concerning the ark itself let me ask this question has the ark been sighted since it landed on mount ararat on the evening of June the 2nd, 1840, a terrific earthquake shook the highest mountain of the Armenian plains located north of Lake Van in Turkey. The name of this shattered mountain is known as Mount Ararat. The power released was beyond that of hundreds of atomic bombs. In fact, it totally wiped out the little village of Ahura at the uh, and the monastery of St. Jacob that had been there at the base of this mount for many years. Now that happened in the evening of June the 2nd, 1840. And since 1840, uh, we're told a number of reports have come to the world's attention concerning the sighting of an ark-like structure of hand-tooled timber on treeless Mount Ararat. And even prior to this, uh, students, should be pointed out, that there have been many ancient reports about this very thing, which includes the testimony of Herodotus, who was the Greek historian, and Josephus, the Jewish uh, historian, and then the Quran, the sacred book of Islamic faith speaks about it, and then Marco Polo, famous European explorer. In fact, uh, at the turn of the, uh, actually in the first few centuries in church history, we re, uh, read reports, they haven't been that documented, but we have reports that the natives report they could see it from the base of Mount Eret, and uh, they had uh, a pilgrimage once a year. They'd go up and visit the ark. Well, within the last 135 years, actually since 1840, there have been the sighting, reported sighting, some 14 occasions that the uh, ark had, or something mysterious, has been seen on Mount Eret. And I'll just call your attention to a few of these, and you'll have the rest of them in your notes. One is Haji Yuriman, and uh, he is a young was a young man uh, living at the base of Mount Ararat in Armenia. And uh, I'm going to read something here now from a book written by V. M. Cummings entitled Noah's Ark: Fable or Fact. And the author says this: His parents, that's Haji Yuriman and family lived at the foot of Mount Ararat in Armenia. According to their traditions, they were descended directly from those who had come out of the ark, uh, but who had never migrated from that country. As a young boy, Hyge and his father hired out as guides for three men who claimed to be scientists and who had come from Europe to investigate the reports of the ark sightings. This was during the summer of 1856. Following, according to the author, is an account told by the aged Hygie to a minister named Harold Williams in May of 1916 in Oakland, California. So this old man now, Hygie, tells about something that happened in 1856. And he's talking to a minister now in 1916 Pastor Harold Williams in Oakland, California. And this is Hygie's story. He said, After extreme hardship and peril, the party came to the little valley way up on Greater Ararat, not on the very top, but a little down from the top. This little valley is surrounded by a number of small peaks. There the ark came to rest in a little lake, and the peaks protected it from tidal waves that rushed back and forth as the flood subsided. On one side of the valley, the waters from the melting snows and glacier spills over a little river that runs down the mountain. According to Hygie, as they reached this spot, and this would have been Hygie and uh, his father and uh, these three scientists coming from Europe, supposedly to investigate the ark. As they reached this spot, there they found the prow of a mighty ship protruding out of the ice. The five went inside the ark and did considerable exploring. It was divided by bars like animal cages of today. 
The whole structure was covered with a varnish of lacquer that was very thick and strong both outside and inside the ship. The ship was built more like a great, a great and mighty house than the hull of a ship, but without any windows. There was a great doorway of immense size, but the door was missing. By the way, in most of these other sightings, this story usually is repeated that the door itself was missing. And some have suggested that perhaps the door, made of wood, was that article, that object that Noah burned uh, in order to set on fire in order to offer the sacrifices that he gave when he received the covenant of the rainbow. So the door was missing. The scientists were appalled and dumbfounded. And uh, then he goes on to say that uh, how excited they were at this finding. Well, they're not only excited, but he says they went into a satanic rage finding what they hoped to prove non-existent. And then Hygie says this, they were so angry and mad that they said they would destroy the ship, but the wood was more like stone than any wood we have now. They did not have tools nor means to wreck so mighty a ship and had to give up. But they did tear out some timbers and tried to burn the wood, but it was so, so hard that it was almost impossible to burn. So they held a council and then took a solemn and fearful death oath. Any man present who would ever breathe a word about what they had found would be tortured and murdered. And they told their guide and his son that they would keep tabs on them and that if they ever told anyone, and they found out about it, they would be surely tortured and murdered. For fear of their lives, Hygie and his father had never told what they had found except to their best trusted and closest relatives. All right, and then uh, author V.M. Cummings goes on to say that in 1918, this was after the story was told to Harold Williams by Hygie, an article appeared in a Brockton, Massachusetts newspaper relating an account of a dying elderly scientist in London. The story was printed because his last words were in the form of a confession of a sort and concern, of all things, the Ark of Noah. His confession gave briefly the same facts and dates that Hygie had related earlier in history. And uh, whether this story can be documented or not, we do not know. But that's just one story. And uh, there are many others. Uh, there's a man named James Bryce. And uh, he reported finding hand tool timber on Mount Ararat in 1876. And uh, then in 1883, the Turkish press reported an article. And assuming uh, are they uh, on that, uh, and during that year, supposedly somebody that summer found the ark. And this was the first, as I understand, the first publicly reported discovery of the Ark in modern time. This would be after the Civil War in 1883. And this Turkish article was picked up and printed by several American newspapers. For example, the Chicago Tribune printed the story on August the 10th, 1883. And um, then on that same day, the New York Herald printed, that, printed the same story. Well, uh, here's another account. And this was an uh, account uh, given by a Russian czar's expedition during the latter part of 1917 in December, when World War I was still going on. There were two research divisions of 150 infantrymen and army engineers and specialists that um, heard some reports about the Ark, and so uh, they made their way up the mountain. And supposedly these uh, engineers from the Russian army, or the czar's army, discovered it in 1917. It was discovered to be leaning on one side toward the shore of a little lake in which the ark was greatly submerged. On one side was a doorway, but according to the testimony of the Russian engineers, the door was missing. Now again, we said it's interesting that as far as we know, they had never read the High G. Yearman's report, but they came up with the same, uh, these may be uh, fictitious uh, fairy stories, but apparently they're consistent fairy stories with some of the details. And uh, the, go the article goes on to say that all stood in awe. They removed their hats, many crossed themselves, and said a brief prayer. And so the engineers measured it. Careful measurements disclosed the ark to be about 500 feet in length, 83 feet in the widest place, 
at about 50 feet high. And the entire rear end of the ark was in ice. But through the broken hatchway near the front of the boat, they were able to enter the first upper room. According to their description, he was very narrow with a high ceiling and surrounded by rooms of various size. And it goes on to say that there was also a very large room separated as by a great fence of huge tree uh, trunks of trees, possibly stables for the huge animals. And then notice this, the same report uh, as uh, given by High G. Yerman, on the walls of the rooms were cages arranged in lines all the way from the floor to the ceiling. And they had marks of rust from iron rods which were there before. The ark was covered from inside and outside with some kind of dark brown color resembling wax and varnish. The wood was excellently preserved, and near the ark they found the remains of some burned wood and a structure put together of stones resembling an altar. And, of course, this would, uh, if the story is true, and we have no way of knowing whether it is or not, would tie in with the Genesis account in Genesis 19. Uh, the pieces of wood were the same as found in the ark, these, uh, re these burned embers. According to the story, the Russian team cut up some pieces from the ark and drew pictures of it, and concludes by saying that upon reaching their homes, however, they found the bloody Vol Bolshevik revolution in full swing. It is reported that they were shot, and their priceless information of, was confiscated by the communist boss Trotsky himself. The two members of this team, however, escaped to America, and uh, they lived out their lifespan in the northwest part of our country. And then, perhaps we have time, uh, this uh, lecture, for one more report here. And... Uh, this was given by a 14-year-old boy. Actually, uh, I say 14-year-old. He was an old Armenian gentleman when he gave the report, but uh, he gave it in 1904, and this concerned when he went up on that mountain with a 14-year-old grandson. And uh, so he says this as they ask him the question. This old Armenian uh, as he tells about his trip with his 14-year-old grandson. Uh, the question, was the ship square or round? No, no, it was neither. It was long, and the sides were tipped out. The part of the bottom was visible like a roof, as flat as can be. They go on to say there was no door on the side. They explored. Now, see, that's the third account we have here, the missing door. Only the window holes in the top under the overhanging roof, about 18 inches high and perhaps 30 inches long, many of them, perhaps 50, uh, this old Armenian said he couldn't count them all, running along the side. For some reason, uh, the pair did not try to walk completely around the ark. The steep cliff was evidently a most effective deterrent, even to this intrepid mountaineer. And uh, they tried to carve out some of the wood, but again, they couldn't do it. In fact, the old man said the grain was plainly visible, but the ark was petrified as hard as rock. He could see no nails, and the sides were so smooth it looked as if it had been molded in one piece. There was no place where one could put his fingers between the cracks, he said. The wood was dark brown, but covered with a soft green mold. And, uh, well, as I said, one of them had tried to uh, uh, cut off a good luck piece with his long steel-bladed knife, but the steel-like material simply would not yield. Now, uh, in uh, her book, uh, the author that we just quoted from, V.M. Cummings, uh, gives a number of uh, other references here, and you'll have these in your notes. Uh, however, um, there is something that we'd like to call your attention to here if I can find it in notes. Uh, some time ago, there was um, an expedition to Mount uh, Ararat, and uh, they found some uh, very strange writing uh, near the ark where the 
disposed of Mount Ararat, uh, was located. And uh, the scientist that did this was a Russian colonel, and his name was Alexander Kor. He's a very brilliant man, and he discovered that area, as I say, in the late 20s and early 30s. He was a Russian colonel. He was a scholar, researcher, author, historian, an etymologist of ancient languages. And especially did Kor specialize in ancient history. And he was an expert on the Babylonian cuneiform and Egyptian hieroglyphics. In uh, 1933, Kor discovered and translated an ancient Sumerian inscription found at Kadara near greater Mount Ararat on the Ardaski Pass. And that leads up to the where the ark supposedly is, is uh, rested. And this inscription tells of a great flood. And the Kadara inscription reads, and this is what Alexander Kor translated, and I think it's extremely interesting. Here's what it reads. God sowed the seeds of the world into the waters. The waters filled the earth, descending from above. His children came to rest on the mountain peak. So, this would indicate at least that there is something up there. Um, there are a number of other reports. Of course, probably the most famous, and there is a book now out by this one, his name is Fernard Navarra, and he's written a book entitled Noah's Ark, I Touched It. And uh, Navarra and his boy, his 12-year-old son, Raphael, uh, made their way up the, on three occasions. And in 1955, uh, they found what they felt to be the ark. And this time, uh, some of the ark, a piece of the ark was taken. And uh, there was a large piece, a hand tool timber, that uh, he cut down, or he cut out of the ark, and he uh, hauled it down to the base of Mount Ararat. And we're told that this wood was lay, and by the way, uh, Fernard Navarra is still living today, and uh, he gave this wood, subjected uh, the wood to an analysis of the University of Bordeaux and at the Forestry Institute in Madrid, Spain. And they gave it a carbon-14 testing. This is what Navarra had brought down from this uh, gigantic uh, structure that he found on Mount Ararat. And the reports are very interesting. Uh, the University of Bordeaux said this, This is fossilized wood and is derived from an epic of great antiquity. And then the uh, Forestry Institute of Madrid, Spain, said after they examined the wood specimen, uh, our analysis, according to Carbon-14, estimates the age of this fragment at approximately 5,000 years. Now, I don't know whether they'll ever find the ark, but I do know this. If they find this strange, mysterious structure uh, some three and a half miles in the air, on a frozen mountain covered by snow, an object 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high made of wood hundreds of miles from a forest, it'll take Eric Severite on the CBS News an extra three minutes in his commentary to explain it away. I suppose they will explain it away, but it will be something certainly embarrassing and and we don't know, but I hope that uh, God would, in his providence and everything, see to it that before he sends the next great judgment, which is the tribulational judgment, perhaps he could allow some of his children, believers, to find an evidence, the last remaining evidence, of the first flood. Well, in chapter 8, we're told that God remembered Noah and every living thing. And then after the 370th day, we're told that the uh, waters subsided enough, and verse 15 of chapter 8, and God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee, and bring forth with thee every living thing that is in thee of all flesh. And then he tells him to be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. This is the second man that has heard this command from God. Uh, Adam heard it, 
be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And then here he says the same thing, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. But here's something is missing. God told Adam to subdue the earth and become the king of creation. But of course, Adam forfeited the right to do this. And so you do not read this statement when God tells Noah to replenish the earth. He does not say subdue it simply because now sin had entered the world. And verse 18, Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with them. And Noah, verse 20, built an altar unto the Lord and he could have used that massive door, uh, the wood from that door to build that altar, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. Now notice that statement, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now here the flood has just ended, and yet God, of course, in his wisdom sees the sinful nature of these three boys and of Noah himself. And uh, someone has said that the, that the flood destroyed sin, perhaps, but not sinners, because men still possessed a sin nature. Now, in verse 22 of chapter 8, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Apparently, this is the beginning now of the present day, winter and summer and fall and spring, four seasons of the year as we know them today. And this gives evidence here of the faithfulness of God all through this generation, until this generation. Father, we thank you the way that she preserved Noah and his wife and their three sons and their three wives. But we know another judgment day is coming, the great fire judgment, and we're thankful that through Christ thou hast provided another ark, but this time not an ark of wood, but an ark of flesh and bone, the body of the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.